recording. Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Can someone yeah. confirm you can yes. see the slide set? Yes. Yes. Okay, great, great, great. So welcome to the first lecture of our um, Network Security Fundamentals class. In this class and tonight, uh, we're gonna learn new subjects of the cybersecurity. But before we even start, we wanna have a quick discussion. Can someone tell me why it is important for all the computers to be secure? Computers within a network will have access to the data or to right. data. Cool. That's a very good reason. I like that. So how about a computer at home that um, doesn't have any, any information on it? Like you don't have no personal information, no bank information. You just use it for playing games. Does that one also need to be secure? Well, yeah, it could, it could be a gateway into say, you have another device that does have that personal information. Right. So besides that, let me ask you this question. What yeah. is the most important and valuable asset that you have in your home network? Personal data. Because you you want to save the the information. You don't want to information be to be I mean, I like the fact that you guys believe personal data or information is uh, very important, and I agree with you. But can we come up with something which is even more important than your information? They, what? They can access to the to the different cameras connected to the to the to the net and uh, uh, see what what you are doing through the camera or your phone or your laptop tablet. Eddie, the I mean, yeah, you're very close right now. So you're talking about they can gain access in a foothold, right? That's going to be a foothold to take next action. But if you think closely about it, the most important asset you have is your connection. If a bad actor wants to commit a crime, the most valuable asset of your network is your internet connection. Because that internet connection is associated with your identity. And a bad actor can easily compromise it, do their bad thing. They can hack into a network from your network, do whatever they want, and guess what FBI traces back to? Your network, right? Yeah. So have that in mind that um, besides all the assets we may have at home that we don't want them to be compromised, we have a connection to the internet, which that connectivity is very, very high value from security perspective. So in this module, in this lecture, hopefully we're gonna learn how to define information security and explain why information security is important. You also are gonna be identified and distinct, being able to distinguish between threats vulnerabilities, threat actors, risk, and different attributes associated with those. You will be able to describe the different type of vulnerability and attacks. And finally, you will be able to explain what does it mean when we say the attack has a specific impact. So let's start with discussion over what is information security itself. So the first step in understanding security is to be able to really define it. What is security? Of course, we already know if we are free from any kind of danger, threat, then we, we feel secure, right? You go to the streets, um, it's a safe street, you feel it, you feel secure, nobody is in there that uh, poses a danger against you. Uh, it's the middle of the day, lights are out, uh, lights are on, everything is feeling good, right? That's, that's the uh, freedom of the danger, right? Uh, or the process that achieves the freedom for you is called security, right? 
Uh, different books, different entities, they have their own different definition of the security. But let's read this one together. As security is increased, convenience has often decreased, no matter how you define the security. Think about it. If I have a, a gold necklace, right? And I want to keep that gold necklace secure. A good idea is put that necklace inside the safe. And um, even better, put that safe inside the secure room. Uh, guys, please mute yourself if you're not talking um, so that we, we don't have the feedbacks here, okay? Please make sure that you are muted. Everyone, please make sure you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so coming back to this, if I leave that uh, gold necklace in a, in a safe and then put that safe in a house which is protected, you know what? Let's take it to a military base and put it in the military base and put some guards around it, put some passwords for it, put some locks on the doors. And you see what's happening now? Each time I want to go and grab that necklace, I have to go over all of these security measures, which is going to take about an hour and a half to be able to gain the necklace, to put it on, go to this party, come back, and then drop it back again for another hour. Guess what happens after a couple of times? You would say, you know what? I'm not going to use it tonight. I'm not going to use it tonight. So because you reduce the convenience and this actually reduces the security, even though it may sound counterintuitive. But after a while, you're going to dismiss the security measures because those are bringing you inconvenience. So no matter how you define security, the more secure something is, the less convenient it will be to use. So information security basically describes all the tasks that you need to do to secure your digital media, right? So we do have three type of data. Uh, you may have heard this terminology before. We say we have data at rest, data in motion, right? And data at process. Basically, these are the three different forms that your data can have. When you save data into your hard drive, that is data at rest. When you move the data between your hard drive and let's say a USB flash drive, while the data is moving between these two, is data in motion. And then finally, when you process data, which means your computer processor, your CPU is working on data, that is what we call data in process. And we wanna keep data safe in all the three stages. Let me ask you this question. Which one do you think is most difficult to secure? Data which is being manipulated by a processor, data in a storage device, or data which is being transferred over a network? Data that's transferred over to a network? Because? Um, because since it's a, uh, it's, it's a guess. Um... Because other people have access like, to the means of transform, uh, transportation, right? Uh, like you are, you are transferring data from your computer to some other computer in the network. Other people have access to the medium that you're using for that transfer. So we do have uh, means to encrypt the data over the network. Like we can send the encrypted data over the network, but it's still, it's never going to be as safe as data at rest because data on a hard drive can be encrypted and hard drive can physically be protected as well, right? The data in process though is this kind of safe data, but at the same time, you cannot encrypt it because processors cannot really process the encrypted data. They need to first decrypt it and then work on it. That's why there are some Trojans, viruses or rootkits that they are designed to attach themselves to somewhere cl very close to your computer processor, like even in your cache, so they have access to a decrypted set of data. So all of them are important, 
But data in transfer or data in motion is the most difficult one to be secured. And actually that's the biggest challenge of cybersecurity. So we talked about lack of convenience when it comes to too much security in place. In order to understand when we can actually be super secure, let's use another, um, another example. The car you drive, and on a daily basis, you need to jump out of the house, jump in the car, drive to work, school, or leisure, whatever, and then come back quickly. Uh, it is protected by uh, an immobilizer system on your key fob, so only your key fob opens it. Some people go and add another car security alarm to it, to their cars. Some people even add a, a shifter lock, you know, those physical locks that they lock the, uh, the, the shifting gear. Some have steering wheel locks. They add steering wheel locks that I don't know if you guys have used them ever or not, but they basically don't let your steering wheel to turn more than a certain degree. You can even add a chain and chain your car to a... <laughs> electrical pulse, right? The more measures of security you put in there to begin with for someone to use it, like if you're not the user, if you're the security guy that is supposed to um, make that car secure and you're adding all of these measures, after a while, the actual user of a car is going to stop using the chain because they're like, ah, every night it takes a long time to grab the chair chain and chain it to the post and then unchain it the day after. After a while, they're like, hey, you know what? That steering wheel lock, I don't use it at all. Why should I even use it? And before you even know, all of those security measures that you had in this, uh, you had in place and you were counting on the security of your system are now obsolete because user doesn't like to use it. A computer word experience. If you ask your users, to use a password, which is 25 characters, is that a secure action or not? Remember, the less number of characters, the easier it is for a hacker to break into it. Uh, yeah, if you mix those characters with numbers and, uh, um, what else the words I'm looking for? And you make, it, you make it less vulnerable to brute force attack, correct? But my question is, okay, you make it super complicated. Are you making the system secure really or not? No, because people will stop using, uh -huh. uh, well, uh, it's no longer convenient to remember 20 characters. You know what happens? Even if you put, first of all, people are gonna start using the words they can remember. Like Ali Kararudi, CCSF, professor one, two, three which is going to be easy to be guessed. That's the first problem. Then you're going to step in and you're going to go ahead and mandate them not to use their first name, not to use their last name. They cannot use a sequence of numbers and they have to use a special characters and all that. Guess what happens next? They're going to write the password on a piece of paper and attach it in their, under their keyboard or something. Real life story, I had a colleague in Google who he had the password written under a keyboard at his home. The guy was IT professional. I went to his home and I looked at the keyboard and I turned it and I was like, are you kidding me? Your password is stuck here. And the answer was, yeah, because I cannot remember it. So you see where I'm going with this, right? you're gonna make it less secure with super securing it. So in, in security, we work with a triad, a triad of CIA. Not Central Intelligence Agency, but confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Where you actually wanna be is um, somewhere in the middle of that triad, right? So, uh, if you have like a, tri a big triad, you want to be somewhere in the middle so that your distance to confidentiality is equal to your distance to integrity and is equal to your distance to the availability. If you can balance between all these three, then you have a secure system. Any questions so far?
just to so confidentiality means no one else can see it integrity means something like no one can tamper with it so confidentiality means data is available only and only to whom it's supposed to be available mm -hmm. availability means if they are supposed to work with it it should be available to them and integrity integrity means the data is what it's supposed to be. So it's not tampered with. Nobody has manipulated it. If that's supposed to be your grade list, right? It should be accurate. It should have the integrity. So we're gonna discuss this in more detail very soon, okay? So, uh, information security starts with a core of uh, the information itself, as you can see in the middle, which we have integrity, confidentiality, and availability that thry at corners. As you can see, this blue box is trying to be as close as possible to all three. It doesn't like to be close to each one of those. Of course, depending on the uh, criticality of the information, you may need to push it more towards confidentiality or more towards integrity. Like if you have top secret documentation that if enemy gains access to those or if a bad actor gains access to those, the impact on it, impact on the system is gonna be catastrophic. That is the information that you wanna decrease the availability of it and get it uh, closer to the confidentiality up there, right? If that is an information that the impact of it is kind of like trivial, like the internal documentation of a company, an email that somebody in the company sends to other one and says, hey, can you please bring me document ABC? Now this internal information can be more towards availability rather than confidentiality, right? If you're using somebody's tax data, you're working for IRS and you're supposed to process that now you can be more towards integrity and confidentiality rather than availability, right? So you as the security specialist are the person who makes the decision that for that specific business case, which one is more important? Does that make sense? So for that reason, a machine cannot make that decision. Otherwise, me and you, we didn't have no job because a machine would have been able to make that decision. But it only goes back to us to make that decision. Then on the layer around our system, we do have the products that we want to make available to people, right? People around the product. So first, products gain access to the information, then people gain access to the information. And then around all of that, to secure all of it, you have policies and procedures that tell everyone, hey, how should you deal with these things? For example, you can have a password policy. The policy that says the, the minimum length of your password is gonna be eight characters and the password is gonna be valid for two months. And then after that, users should change it. So with application of those policies and procedures, you're gonna keep the system secure. Those can be guidelines and printouts that you give to the employees or actually can be applied through uh, digital mechanisms like GPO or group policy objects, right? So let's let's talk about this and see if we can um, we can answer this question. As security increases, the convenience of using a system also is increasing. Is that true or false? False. False. False, good job. So you guys have been listening to me, I like it. So you already know why. So now let's talk about who are the threat actors. So, so far we discussed about what is the basic concept of security. Now let's see, okay, what are these threats around and who are the threat actors that we have to be worried about? In definition, a threat actor is an individual or entity responsible for cyber incidents against technology equipment of enterprise and users. These are not necessarily individuals or necessarily entities. This can be codes. 
This can be machines. This can be different devices, right? The generic term attacker is what we use for a threat actor. But in most of the uh, advanced text, especially when it comes to uh, scholar text, the word threat actor is what is being used. So in financial crimes, you often have three different categories, right? You have individual users, enterprises, and governments who make those uh, crimes, right? Who commit those crimes. And there are three type of attackers or hackers that we have in this uh, category of the threat actors. We have black hat hackers, white hat hackers, and gray hat hackers. Let's, let's see if you guys have the knowledge of defining those. Who knows what is a black hat hacker or who is a black hat hacker? Someone who hacks for malicious purposes. And how about white hats? Maybe a white hat would be someone who's uh, like actually um, doing pen testing. Right, like a, gray hat. That I'm not sure about. Can you say what uh, about? Wow. <laughs> so gray hat hackers are walking the fine line. They don't follow the rules of the society. They follow their own rules. They decide, okay, you know what? If this doctor is earning money from malicious practices, I make a decision and hack into his security network and put his house on fire. What he does from our perspective may not be ethical, from his perspective may be. So they think they're doing the best thing, but they're walking the fine line between being a black hat and white hat. When you're a white hat hacker, and, and guys, these none of these is really a very clear boundary. The boundaries between all these are very blurry. It's gonna be ethical discussions and all of those goodies come in with it. And uh, I, I don't wanna get involved in that, right? But just, just understand that these are just uh, simple terminologies that common people who get the, right. the basic knowledge about computer word, they okay. actually use. Guys, is there any question? Okay. So the same way that you have financial crimes, you have digital crimes and the digital word the threat actors could be individual threat actors. They may be enterprises or groups like uh, anonymous, right? Or they may be governments who, who do act as the bad actors, who do act as the threat actor. Uh, there is a cybersecurity war between countries. Countries try to gain access to each other's um, critical infrastructure. So they hire hackers to hack into the other country's critical infrastructure. So at the time of the war, they can shut off all the power to this country or they can do other stuff, right? We do have this little guys, <laughs> script kiddies. So sitting at moms and pops home, looking up online, search Google for how to hack into a wireless network downloading the tools that they can barely understand what they are, right? And just running the automated tools and being able to successfully do some small attacks. So these are those who really want to perform attacks, but they don't have the knowledge to do so. So these are the guys who are actually uh, relying on the available tools. What you see here on the right is, is this, familiar to anyone. This is a screenshot of a system, of a it's Linux a, system. Yeah. That's yeah. Kali. That's Kali Linux, right. If you go to Kali Linux, there are two preloaded tools that you can use to hack. Like one of the things you can use is Kismet, K-I-S-M-E-T. With Kismet and air cracking tools, those two tools, 
you can easily hack into uh, unsecure wireless networks around your home. And more than 55%, more than 60% of the homes have unsecured wireless. So their passwords are WPA or WPA2, older versions of encryption. So Kismet and air cracking can easily break into their um, wireless password. Are you a hacker? No. But the definitions we have, at least for the sake of this class, they call you a script kitty, or you know what is the other name for these guys? Cyberpunks. So uh, it's very easy to be in a script kitty. Just, just download a tool and go with it. The other guys out there are hacktivists. These are the individuals that have an ideology or a motive uh, for something that they believe is a principle, is good, and they hack for that. So these are usually breaking into a repository of information, uh, getting that information uh, published, like what uh, Wikileaks does, right? Or um, getting into a website and change the content, content to what they believe is correct and they believe they should be. Uh, and usually uh, these are um, the attacks for, for an ide idea. There is an idea behind the scene, right? Some of them are uh, retaliatory, right? Like the example you see on the slide, hacktivists have disabled the bank's website that didn't allow online payment deposited to the accounts belonging to the groups supported by hacktivists. This is, this is where we can say these guys are uh, gray hats, right? They're walking the fine line. They believe they're doing good, but the bank people and the law believes they're doing bad. Does that make sense? So gray hat hackers for that reason. So let's talk about the governments now. Governments increasingly want to have their own team of hackers. Militaries, they have their cyber uh, cyber armies, right? Like I don't remember about two years ago. If you if you were on the news, you should have heard about uh, Iranian cyber army took over Google's uh, Gmail certifications in Europe, and they gained access to millions of Gmail accounts, right? They were supported by the uh, by the government. Another example on the other side of the aisle, now that we talk about Iran, was uh, the virus called the Stuxnet. That was an Israeli-backed uh, project that was injected into Iran's nuclear system uh, through a hacking process, right? So there are many researchers um, in the universities uh, that uh, are being employed or um, are working on the projects for the states, right? And usually these are dangerous. Usually these are very uh, sophisticated, knowledgeable technical people who do this. So uh, state actors usually are involved in multi-layer intrusion or sometimes even long-term intrusion. Like they have plans to get something done within two, three, four years, right? And what they do usually is they try to find the foothold inside an entity and then move from there and maybe just getting the foothold inside is going to take a year of attacking a network to get that and then hiding everything in there and then moving after them this this new class of attacks are called advanced persistent threat or apt a good example of apt is the attack that happened on target target years ago Anybody here remembers the attack on Target where they lo lost a lot of credit card information to Russians? No, no one? Yeah, so it's, it's a sophisticated attack happened. I, let me just see. I'll, I'll find the year for, for you later. I believe that was 2015 or 16. That true uh, two-year-long uh, process, they were able to go around the FireEye and steal all of those information out of target database. And that happened in the Christmas time, which they couldn't shut off. 
Uh, a lot of us got new cards. I was one of those guys. I, I purchased the stuff in Target and they sent me a new credit card because the old one was compromised through that attack. But any kind of attack that persistently is uh, being happening, like continuously a plan is behind it to happen, called an APT. APTs are also... Uh, a category of insider threats. Because if you have a foothold in your company being compromised by an attacker or a group of attackers, then they can use that foothold from inside to compromise your network without any kind of hassle. So for example, a disgruntled employee, right? A contractor who doesn't have any stake or any kind of vendor that works with the company can pose an insider threat of manipulating the data and um, either taking over the network, compromising the network, or manipulating the integrity of the data within that network. So basically, um, changing the values. Think about it. Like if I am, if I'm in, I don't know, IRS as an uh, insider threat, I can easily change the values on the tax documents and change a lot of stuff, right? So look at this report that came out in 2020. Six out of 10 enterprises reported being a victim of at least one insider attack during 2019. It's a huge number, guys. Six out of 10 is really big. So their focus was what? Intellectual property or IP theft very much in Bay Area. This is one of the biggest problems. r and is like, uh, one of you guys is a Googler, I, I forgot your name, but if you try to go to Area 51, you're gonna see it's impossible for you to walk in unless you have something to do in Area 51, which is under the definition of your, your job description. Back in the day when I was in Area 51 and I needed IT, I needed to walk to the IT station never IT people were coming to us, right? Because they want to keep the intellectual property safe. And for those of you who don't know, Area 51 in Google is an incubator of the ideas. So when the new idea is supposed to turn into technology, it goes into a small project within Area 51. Anyway, uh, the sabotage. Disgruntled employees, 41 person, that's big too. And espionage, you know, industrial espionage, technical espionage, and sometimes even um, militaristic espionage, 32 person. So as you can see, this is growing super big. Insider threat is becoming huge. And every year in every seminar, hackathon, or whatever you go, you're going to figure out it's growing to be considered bigger and bigger of an attack. Okay. So let's quickly look at the other attacks. Uh, uh, the threat actor could be a competitor, right? Um, to steal new product, research, a list of current customers, or gain any kind of competitive edge over the current company. Criminal syndicates, um, they usually run by a small number of experienced online criminal networks that do not commit crime themselves, but act as the entrepreneurs. The shadow IT, this is one of the biggest problems of the companies who try to tighten the security too much, and therefore their IT procedures are complicated, uh, lengthy, and not effective. So then installing personal equipment on authorized software or using external cloud resources can create a weakness or expose sensitive corporate data. Like when they don't let you uh, use a printer and you really want to do print something and it takes two days for them to come and install a printer in your room, you possibly are going to send it to your Google Drive, then go with your own personal account and print it, right? But you're basically breaking the security perimeter that they have around their IT and digital world. Brokers who are individuals who uncover uh, weaknesses, but they do not report it to the IT or vendors. Instead, they sell it. They sell it in the dark web and make sure that uh, they make good money out of it without themselves exploiting anything. 
there, there were a couple of Microsoft employees fired for brokering the vulnerabilities. We're just going to dark web and let everybody know, hey, this is the vulnerability that this application of Microsoft has. How much you pay? Okay, 100 Bitcoins, yours. And then the attacks were happening the day after. And finally, we have the cyber terrorists. Targets may include a small group of computers or networks that can affect the largest number of users, such as the computers that control electrical power, PG&E, for example, right? Or the gas. Um, anybody heard about the colonial gas pipe uh, cybersecurity incidents? Yes, of course. Yeah. 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 So that was one of these, these issues. Right after that, PG&E started implementing very tough um, procedures and security countermeasures. And actually, TSA got involved. TSA created a directive for all the utility and gas companies around the United States to follow more restricted uh, controls. So that's, that's what we call it, the cyber terrorists. So knowledge check. Which type of threat actor is often involved in multi-year intrusion campaigns targeting highly sensitive economic, proprietary, or national security information? Who wants to answer this for us? Insider, hey. State actor. State actor, yeah. State actor. Okay, the survey says state actor. So when we talk about multi-year intrusion, that, that, should, that should make you sensitive towards the state actors, right? It's only a state actor who spends that much time to gain, um, to gain a, a, a benefit. Remember, none of these things that we say is stone engraved answer. Like one of you guys said, insider. Question is, can't an insider attacker do this? plan to get hired for this airplane company, plan to get hired as a pilot, go to school, become a pilot, get hired as a pilot, ride the plane only to hit it to Pentagon. We had that story happening in 9-11, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is, even though the state actor is the correct answer, and if you saw it in the quiz, definitely go for that, but insiders can also get involved in that. So the whole idea is the boundaries are blurry. They're not like sharp boundaries that you can say what exactly this person can be called. But the goal of this discussions is for you guys to get a better understanding of uh, possibilities so that when you want to secure a system, you consider all of these possibilities along. Couple of more definitions, right? Um, social engineering. Can someone tell me what is social engineering? Like doing things to get at maybe like your birth date and other things where you kind of voluntarily give the information. Hold, hold, on, a second. hold on a sec. Who's talking? Oh, Anat. Anat, how old are you? Uh, uh, do I have to disclose that? <laughs> uh, Oh, okay, hold on. Let me let me let me know this. Where do you live? I live in California. <laughs> this is social engineering right now, right here. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Good, no, answer, Good answer, Anat. Good answer. So social engineering happens in a way that you don't even see it coming. How many of you guys guess that I'm doing that right now? Yep. You see, you see what I'm talking about? Yep. Yeah, somebody actually shared an awesome video on the discussion or on the um on the board earlier. Or was it yesterday? Uh, and it shows this woman just uh calling uh an, a random person and had like uh, the voice of a crying baby in the background, and she just got all this information from her just because she put that stress on her as well. Right, exactly. Like right now, I came out of the blue asking her questions and she was not even thinking about what am I doing? She was just thinking, should she answer those or not? Because those were really personal, right? And you don't, you would never ask those questions. But in occasions, people under stress can easily give up information. 
like they call you and they say, hey, I mean, this is so old, but hey, we are from um, IRS. Your name popped up, you have tax fraud, you owe $4,000, the police is on the way to catch you. And now the person is jumping up and then, what should I do? I'll pay it. Yes, go. I mean, you know how many people in United States have gone, purchased gift cards from Target to pay these scammers? without even thinking how IRS is accepting Target gift cards. That's one of my guilty pleasures is to watch YouTube channels of uh, guys who mess with uh, those hackers. They're pretty entertaining. They use like voice changers and they they kind of hack, like they 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 just mess with all the scammers and they'll, they'll waste like an hour of their time. It's pretty entertaining. I have seen those uh, scammers uh... They bully by other guys uh, by by messaging. They send a message saying that they are from a company, IRS, or something like that. And this guy just start replying with a really full answer, just to make them full. Yeah, that's these these are these are simply happening right now. We are talking about social engineering, so you you guys have your antennas up. And you're sensitive. But when you're not sensitive, it's so easy to happen because all of us are social animals. We love to socialize. We love to talk. And if somebody can talk to us nicely and softly, that's the time that we start giving up information that we think it's trivial. Sitting on a, on a bar, I mean, everybody here is 21 plus, right? No, but I want to be careful about my examples. So... Sitting at a bar, somebody approaches you. Hey, uh, can I sit here next to you? Of course, I'm a nice person. How are you? What's your name? This. Oh, my name is John Doe. I'm a teacher at blah, blah. What are you? Oh, yeah, I'm a teacher at CCSF as well. Cool. When did you come? Where I mean, and then question after question. Before you even know, they know your address, where you live. They know your hobby. They know you have a dog. They know your dog's name. Don't tell me. But I bet there is at least one student in this class that uses their pet name in their passwords. And that's it. What's your name? Oh, your mom. What was your mom's name? Oh, Gina Smith. Was that her maiden name as well? No, 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 no. Her maiden name was Jane, uh, I don't know, Doe. Oh, cool. So your mom lives with you, right? Oh, which street are you living in? Nice, that city. And guess what? I'm going to call your Bank of America tomorrow. And I say, hey, I'm Jane Doe. I forgot my password. Cool. What is the last four digit of your social? I can easily get that. I just need to make a couple of phone calls to you and fool you into giving me the last four digit, right? Which street are you living on? This is street. What is your mother's maiden name? This is it. What is the name of your first pet? This is it. And those are the common questions that we all use in our online accounts, right? Is there anybody who is not doing it? Is there anybody who is lying on those questions? Because I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Because yeah, I do lie in those questions. I pick, I pick very nonsense answers. Yep. But I, I, have, I have created a hypothetical person who is me for those questions. I know that the fake Ali lives in the city of Akara. And his pet name is Devil, and his mother's maiden name is this and this and that and that. So I have that fake person. So if you know me through social engineering, you don't know anything that can be used against me. Right? So social engineering comes in different flavors, right? Let me just jump into there. Now that we're talking about social engineering, I want to continue on that, and then I'm going to come back. So... The social engineering basically means eliciting information or gathering data just based on somebody's weaknesses and keeping themselves secure from uh, information sharing perspective, right? Uh, psychologically, you want to talk to them in a way that you provide a reason. Like if you ask them where they leave, you don't want to start right off the bat and say, hey, where is your home? But you, you ask a couple of questions leading them there, right? You want to project confidence to them, share something back with them. 
oh, you live in the city? I live in the city as well. By the way, I'm on Mission Street. Where are you? Oh, Knob Hill? Where in the Knob Hill, man? Oh, have you ever been to this bar in Polk named Cinch or something? And then Project of Confidence, you are from the same place. Show them that, hey, I, I know the area like you know and, and like that, right? Use evasion and diversion. And finally, make them laugh, get friendly with them, get all the information that you need. So there are uh, multiple flavors, right? And the, all of those flavors usually involve impersonation. So I will masquerading myself as a character that is interesting for you, right? And uh, if I know about you, like if I know you are a, a cat person, I will approach you with many stories about my non-existent cats and how funny they are. And one day they were uh, very vulnerable for such a reason and I helped them. I even may shed some tears, <laughs> right? And make you feel like, hey, you're close. Phishing attacks are one of the most commonly used uh, social engineering attacks. They come in different flavors again. Spear phishing, and guys, those four names are just categorization, okay? You need to memorize them for the quiz. Uh, just remember, you're going to see some questions about those very soon. Spear phishing is when you uh, go for a specific individual for a specific purpose and attack them like that. Whaling, as the name whale constitutes, is going for the big fishes in the enterprise. Like do the fishing for uh, the CEO, the C-level guys, like CEO, CIO, all of those guys. Does anybody know what is vishing? It's voice over IP phishing. So voice over IP phishing is called vishing. And uh, that's when somebody calls you and tells you that your Bank of America account was compromised and they need to make sure it's you. So they ask for your information. What is your password? What is your last word digital social? And you give them all up on a phone call. And can you guess what is smishing? Is it uh, SMS? Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. See, now you can see how they put the names. So that's when you send somebody a text and within that text, you send them a link that redirects them somewhere that you need them to enter the information that you want to mine out of them, right? So there are different methods. Usually uh, social engineering is the beginning of another attack. Social engineering itself is not an attack unless, unless you wanna attack on someone's personality or expose their personality, right? Uh, but otherwise in cyber world, you get access to the information that you need to compromise an IT system through social engineer. So uh, more talk about the psychological approaches. You always wanna have redirection, right? Um, you wanna redirect user to a fake uh, lookalike site, like create a link and develop a website that looks like Facebook and tell them, hey, uh, Jane Doe sent you a greeting on Facebook, go ahead and see that. They click on the link, then uh, username password is entered because they think they're on Facebook website. You're gonna get that in the back end. Those of you who are familiar with software development can easily develop something like this. And then you redirect them to Facebook, sending the actual username password. So they actually log on. They think everybody was good, but no, they actually had the middleman, which was you who stole the information. Also, you can spam them, right? Um, unsolicited email and with their, put an image, put, uh, put a link, put some kind of redirectory uh, tool to send them where you want them to be sent, okay? Look at this. What in this email can tell you if this is a spam or not? Uh, the link. The email link is a good idea. Who it's from. Who is from. Good. You see the email address is kind of crazy. The subject. The subject as well. Yes. That text when I was going through the when I was going through this um, on the module, 
the text. I was actually reading what it said uh, at the bottom, the nonsense yeah. text. Exactly. Bottom. Or very bad design and all that. So uh, be very careful when you get those emails. But here we just want to say it's very easy. But remember, these are the poor social engineering attacks. There are professional ones that are designed in a way that you cannot even guess. Like I would never put purchase here with this link. I would just purchase here www.amazon.com and then I'm going to redirect that link to the website that I want it to be. So you can make these more sophisticated. You can make this more effective if you have a better knowledge. Do of, they do, uh, sorry, do they do uh, like multi-layer attacks where they bomb you with low level spam? They hit you with a little bit of medium and then like a high value uh, sort of like spam email? Uh, why not? Why not? Okay. If it comes, if it comes to your mind right now, that can happen. Anything yeah, that comes to your mind that can happen, right? Yeah. Never, ever, never, ever click on a link unless you first hover your mouse over it and see what is the actual address of the link. Because the link text, link text mm -hmm. could be could be designed right. Like um, I'm going to show you one very very quickly right here. I'm going to add a link here for the address. I'm going to put www.google.com, right? For the text, yeah. I'm going to put www.ccsf.edu. So basically, Correct. when you see it over here, it says CCSF. If you hover over it, actually, it has to be in the... Uh, in the view of yeah. Let me just go and uh, hit an F5. It should be like this. Yeah, you see, if I go over here, if I hover over it, you see it says that it's www.google.com. Correct. Right? So the, this is kind of like cleaner way of doing a social engineering attack rather than um, what you just saw on that image. So next thing is uh, using hoaxes, which are false warnings. And often they, they have like a link there again, and they ask you to do something. They come to you and say, hey, um, every email in your university or college was compromised with uh, log4j virus. To remove the virus right now, click here. And the email supposedly comes from, let's say, Contra Costa Community College District or comes from city of San Francisco district. So even on the email, to, uh, email uh, field on the top, you see the address is good because you can hide the address the same way that you can change your name in the address, right? Instead of uh, putting your, uh, let's say, Ali Kararudi at uh, Los Madonna study you, I can simply change it to uh, Ali at ccsf.edu instead of my name. That's going to be shown over there. So you have to be careful. Just hover your mouse over it without clicking, kind of like inspect everything before you react. And then uh, finally, a watering hole attack is redirected towards a smaller group of specific individuals. Those who gather around the same watering hole, they have the same idea. Like this class could be a watering hole and we can be attacked on the Zoom. If someone jumps on the Zoom without having the password, and that's the reason that all of you guys use the password to log in today. Because if someone else comes in, into this watering hole that we are all around it, and then post something into the chat, right? Right here. Like you see right now, JD has posted a link. <laughs> I'm not gonna click on it, JD, sorry. And if that person is a malicious person and post a link, most of us are gonna click on it because we kind of trust each other, right? And we're like, yeah, okay, let me see what link he sends. And that's when I'm going to be redirected there. Any questions so far? Cool. So physical procedures. So physical attacks under uh, social engineering category take advantage of user actions that can result in compromised security. There are three 
that we want to look at. One is dumpster diving, tailgating, and shoulder surfing. Dumpster diving involves digging through trash and find information that you have discarded. How many of you guys actually shred the emails that come to you from your bank or utility company? I shred everything. I do. Here. What do you mean by shred? It's mm -hmm. something that you would do to a physical letter, no? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like an actual, like like an actual apart. shredder. Like a piece of physical paper and shred it. I use like the the micro cross shredder that turns it into like. So you're saying that there's a digital version of this? Yes. And that's when you look at somebody's search uh, history, right? Like, um, I don't so know. So, like, for example, not storing cookies or deleting them off and things like that. Okay. So, if I put online, look, can you see my screen now? My, uh, what are you seeing right now? That the, yeah, slide six of eight. Okay, so I have to, I have to do this. Wait a sec, let me just do this. Okay, uh, I have to change it. But if you go to the uh, to the search bar of your browser, right, and in the search bar to, uh, bar of your browser, you usually go where, like you go to Bank of America or you go to whatever bank you have. If you start typing the beginning of name of the banks. You can easily figure out the person who owned this computer goes to which bank. And right there, you can figure out where is their account. Or if they go to a specific website, a specific services that they receive, we're trying the first couple of letters, but the suggestions, you can figure out um, what are the websites they usually go to. Again, Naming conventions, I'm not a big fan of these, but uh, they, they like to have these and uh, that's, that's basically introducing a common language. So for that reason, we go through it this week. So look at the items that they can retrieve from your computer. They can look into your calendar. Your Google calendar is already logged in. How many of you guys, if you type calendar.google.com, your calendar is not logged in. Almost everybody, right? Okay. Uh, this is bad because they can actually gain access to it. I want to even tell you something worse. Everybody open up your uh, Google Chrome. On top, type in setting slash. And then go to the right, those three dots on the top corner on the right, click on those. And then come down and click on setting. When you're in the setting, on the search setting, key in password. Is everybody following me? Um, yes. My, my bad, I don't use Chrome. Okay. Do okay, so you can do it on the edge or Internet Explorer. So on that page, click on Password Manager. And you see, those are all your passwords. And if you click on the I, uh, icon on the right, it's going to ask for your computer password. And if you key in your computer password, you can see that password. Isn't that crazy? So My, if, mine doesn't save them, but I don't know if like. No, a lot uh, of people save those, right? A lot of people save those. And the problem is if you lend your laptop to someone and give them, give them your password to the laptop, they can easily open the Chrome and mine all of your passwords in clear text. That's, that's the type of dumpster diving that you can do in somebody's computer. I already got my friend's password for his EDD. <laughs> <laughs> dumpster diver right there. 
Okay, I didn't, uh, well. I didn't tell you that then. <laughs> okay, so you, so you see what I'm talking about. There is a lot about the computer work that normal users don't know about. You don't know with the, with the computer password only, any password, and you know, Chrome by default is saving the password. A lot of people just don't notice it. So that, that was just a proof of concept. But um, for those who know what they do, they use uh, password managers. And the password managers need another password, not the computer password. Or if you're on a Mac or Apple computer, then you're using keychain that is associated with your, um, with your fingerprint or something. It's a little bit safer, but a steal your computer password or your Apple account can open all of those. So tailgating occurs when an unauthorized person opens an entry door, right? And the other ones go after him. Can you give me an example of tailgating in digital world? You if, log into uh, you log into your school account at the library. You don't log out, and you leave the computer. You left the door open, and somebody else can tailgate in. I was thinking more like there are some. Maybe maybe it's more than some sites where they don't actually expire out your 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 session, so someone can still pretend to be you later. Yep, if the session is not timed out properly, and the session is already uh, established, the next person can tell you in. Same quote, same same concept. So we have the shoulder surfing. This, this is known to all of you, right? Rude people, they look over your shoulder and observe the information. Or they can even just remember the way you moved your finger and with a couple of errors, they can figure out what was your password. So overall, social engineering is responsible for more than 80% of the attacks that we actually uh, see happening in the cyber world. And this report is from last year. More than 80% of the attacks are start with social engineering. If you're interested, look for target cybersecurity incident that I just referred to. And it all starts from an IT person who is drinking and telling someone that our company is going to change the firewall within two weeks. And then they know the firewall is going to be changed in two weeks and they start the attack. It all starts from that point. Anywho, let's talk about the vulnerability. So vulnerability is a flaw in the system that can be exploited by an attacker, okay? So usually we categorize cyber vulnerabilities into platform vulnerabilities, configuration vulnerabilities, vendor vulnerabilities, patches, and zero days. Let's quickly go over all of these, uh, but Beforehand, um, I want to see if anybody has ever heard about zero day vulnerabilities. That's like when someone comes out with a exploit the day something launches, right? Like a new operating system or a new patch or something, right? All, almost there, yeah. When someone uh, exploits a vulnerability for, for the first time ever and the company is not aware of it yet. So the patches are not out for it yet, but it got exploited. That's called zero day vulnerability. And usually they get patched. Anybody has heard about uh, Patch Tuesdays? That's the day, the first Tuesday of each month is when Microsoft releases the patches. So can you guess what is Mayhem Wednesday? It's when all, everybody's finding all the, all the bugs and all the back doors and all the fun exactly stuff. so think about it the patches come out on tuesday of the first month attackers are sitting at their computers waiting for the patch they uh, reverse engineer the patch figure out what vulnerabilities are out there that the patch is trying to address and then they have a day tomorrow to exploit all those before people actually install the patches and that's why they call it Mayhem Wednesday, okay? 
So all of the platforms that are around us to some extent are gonna have vulnerabilities. It's impossible to have a day that you can say a system is free of vulnerabilities on that specific day. Because you may be patching and fixing the vulnerabilities you found a week ago, but as we go forward, the vulnerabilities are being found. So if you're interested, you can look up CVEs, just look up CVE and Myra framework. This is where you can uh, see different vulnerabilities associated with different systems, which are known to this framework and the framework reports those all. So configuration vulnerabilities, those are because of specific configuration, maybe a port is open, maybe an IP address is a static or dynamic or something like that. For those, you're gonna have weakness, which can be exploited. Third parties or vendors, um, they are basically introducers of vulnerabilities in a lot of occasions, right? Like um, they outsource the code development and they don't have access to the uh, actual source and they don't follow secure code development processes properly. And they just introduced you introduce those to your enterprise network. Also, the connectivity between you and your vendor can be a vulnerability because you may have a super nice and tight perimeter, cybersecurity perimeter, but you just hired this payroll company that wants to have a VPN into your network, and their network is very vulnerable. So an attacker who attacks their network can easily come to your network because your network considered theirs as a secure network, right? Uh, we talked about the patches and zero days. Most of the companies have a patch management plan, which means they really don't install the patches on day one. Also, they wanna have uh, pilot systems that those pilot systems basically are test systems that the patches first get installed on those. Sometimes even the patches you install introduce new vulnerabilities. And you really don't want to go with the patches right off the bat. Uh, a good structure has three environments. They have test environment, which is the lowest environment, right? Then they have QA environment, which is the middle environment. And then they have the prod or production environment which is the higher environment, right? So these environments that they have are mirroring each other. Like if you have five computers in the prod with the specification ABC, you're gonna have the same three computers identical in the QA and then three computers identical in the test. So to have five computers in the prod and work with them, a good design, means you need to have 15 computers in the, in the network. Whatever you want to test, whatever you want to develop, actually the test environment also is called dev environment. So whatever you want to test or develop, you do it in the dev environment, the lowest environment, which is absolutely isolated from the other two. When you're sure about what you have and your tests are all passed successfully, you move everything now to the QA environment where your users are going to do quality assurance, work with it, and make sure it's not breaking, it's not having any issues, all good. And that's only when you're going to move it to the prod. So basically, the patches come to the Q, uh, to the dev, after a while go to QA, and then go to the prod. So uh, that's that's the way the actual good practice of patch management is. Uh, so for the zero-day vulnerability we already discussed, these are the vulnerabilities that are exploited before the company itself even know they exist. So usually it's so difficult for the zero-day uh, to be stopped right away because you don't know how to stop it. A good example in December, I don't know if you guys follow cybersecurity bulletins, but who has heard about this guy? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, this was a big deal in December. And a lot of companies, including pg and &E actually, 
went almost back to their uh, to their wall. I mean, all pushed, got pushed back against the wall with lock for J, and they needed to scramble and quickly push it out of the system because that was a severity five vulnerability that was a zero day, um, and yeah, and and a lot of companies got involved in that. So zero days are really dangerous. So an attack vector, another terminology, is a pathway or avenue used by a threat actor to penetrate a system. They can be grouped into any of these categories. You can have email attacks, wireless attacks, removable media attacks, direct access or VPN attacks, social media attacks, supply chain, like your vendor, right? Or from the cloud. Uh, but it really doesn't matter which way it comes in. A good security perimeter should consider zero trust. So basically what we say is in zero trust strategy, what you get is you consider any connectivity to your perimeter or any device that comes to your perimeter is not trusted at all. So you apply the same controls, same security measures, same uh, security control adventures to every single device and the zero trust model. We will discuss zero trust model later, I believe in week four and five, more in detail. So we discussed the social engineering ones. So I'm gonna jump over social engineering ones. Let's do a knowledge check. Who wants to answer this? Which type of attack is not a form of social engineering attack? A hoax. Zero day. Zero day. Zero day. Zero day. Yeah, that's the zero day. Watering hole, hoax, and tailgating are all social engineering attacks. So zero day, you don't need a social engineering attack. You basically need to be researching as most of the black hats and even gray hats and white hats always do this. If you are in this business, you're always researching for, um, for possible vulnerabilities. And let me know if you're familiar with any of these. Yes. 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 Yeah. These yes. are the place, these are yes. the tools and yes. places you search for vulnerabilities, right? Basically, everyone in dark web is talking about these things. Okay. I didn't even say that. Cool. Remember, in, in, in the school, we don't teach you to be hackers. We teach you to be security specialists. But with the knowledge you gain, you can be hackers. <laughs> okay. So now let's talk about the impact. So, so far, we talked about, and let me just put it down here. So we talked about a threat that this threat basically attacks a vulnerability. And then as a consequence of this attack, there is an impact, right? And this impact could be data impact or could be different effects on the organization. Uh, the impact could be even just reputation of an organization, right? And some organizations, when they lose that reputation, that means they lose money, okay? So uh, the impacts can be data loss, which is destroying data so that it cannot be recovered. Let's say you have some information that you use for your day-to-day -day, uh, business. The data loss means your business is down, basically. So um, an example is maliciously erasing patient data used for cancer research. So that company, that pharmaceutical company cannot continue their cancer research and they may lose to their uh, competi competitor. We do have data exfiltration, which is stealing data to distribute it to other parties. Industrial espionage, industrial spies, they can just steal this and sell it to the other company. It could be a data breach, which is a stealing data to disclose it in an unauthorized fashion. 
hey, um, this is what government is trying to do in Syria, right? That's a data breach. Identity theft, uh, taking personally identifiable information. One thing that you're gonna hear from me a lot here after in this class is, I'm gonna refer to this as PII, personally identifiable information, right? To impersonate someone, and this is basically like stealing somebody's social security number to secure a bank loan in victim's name. When your identity is, uh, is stolen, someone can open up an account, a credit account, and take, take a mortgage loan under your name, live their life happily ever after, don't pay it, go foreclose under your name, and leave to the next fraudulent act they have. And guess who is a problem? You with your bankruptcy that you don't even know you're in. So these attacks may uh, make the systems inaccessible for an enterprise. And sometimes that is crucial and uh, morbid for an enterprise to get to the situation that their systems are not available anymore. Uh, productivity can be lost, reputation can be lost, and either way that is extremely unacceptable. Let's check in knowledge here. Which type of data impact would result if an attacker stole a list of customers for the purpose of selling the list to a competitor? B. B, data exfiltration. Yep, exfiltration. the survey, survey says the same thing data exfiltration. So you guys have been listening very well. So data exfiltration is the stealing of data for the purpose of distributing it or selling it to other parties. Um, you can even just steal the data from inside and email them outside. That's not necessarily just grabbing your hard drive and get out, right? You can digitally steal that data. Any questions so far, guys? Cool. Let's uh, let's answer a couple of these questions before we close. Um, can you guys, and you don't need to answer this, but just tell me yes or no. Can you guys now define information security and uh, explain why information security is important? Yes. Yes. Cool. Yes. Cool. Yes. Can you guys identify threat actors and the attributes associated with those? Yes. Yes. Cool. Can you describe the different types of vulnerabilities and attacks? Yes. 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 Awesome. Can you explain the impact of attacks? Yes. 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 Outstanding. Outstanding. So yes. basically what we did was we talked about the attacks against information security have grown out of astronomically in the recent years. And especially guys in the last two years, due to the COVID, everybody was sitting at home and they're, they're trying to do whatever they can on their computers. So a lot of script kiddies that we discussed um, have joined the pack. So their number has astronomically grown. Uh, we talked about the information security workforce is usually divided into two broad categories information security managerial personnel and, and the technical personnel. And we started talking about the high level ones. We said security can be defined as necessary a step to protect from harm. The threat actors fall into several categories and exhibit different attributes. Script kiddies do their work by downloading automated attack software from websites and using it to break into computers. Cybersecurity vulnerabilities are often categorized into five broad categories. We talked about platforms, config, third party or vendors, patches, and zero days. We talked about modern hardware and software platforms provide a wide array of features and security settings. An attack vector was defined, which is a pathway or avenue used by a threat actor to penetrate a system. Social engineering was discussed as a means of eliciting uh, information by relying on weaknesses of individuals, mostly psychological weaknesses. And finally, we talked about a successful attack always results in several negative impacts like data loss, exfiltrations, data breach, and identity theft. 
With that being said, I'm going to go and stop the recording here.